My name is Alice Limoncial. I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Biocrates. And today I will walk you through my current view on how metabolomics helps us to better understand microbiome and helps us also to get an interesting set of tools to progress, especially medicine and medical research. I, I won't take too much time because I really want to focus on what our other two speakers have to say, but I wanted to set a bit the stage because we have people from different fields who, who joined us today. Um, we have um, people here in attendance who are more on the microbiome side and others who are more metabolomics experts. And um, each of these disciplines has its own specialties and has its own peculiarities. And we all become experts of, of uh, our own field. And when two fields interact like this, they have to find a language to, to speak together. But I, I hope that I can show you in the few slides that are coming that there's a lot that metabolomics can bring to the microbiome field and that there are certain applications that are particularly relevant where both fields together can help us do better science and have better medicine also. So I will discuss about me metabolomics in general and uh, have a special focus towards the end on how both fields together work to drive innovation. For those of you who are more on the microbiome side or even who are joining because they're interested in both fields but don't necessarily know much about metabolomics, um, this is one way to represent the different types of omics that we more and more play with. We've put metabolome here at the core, not only because Biocrisis is a metabolomics company, but also because it is really at the crossroads of different streams of influence. One that has been heavily discussed in the last couple of decades is the genome. So our genetics is going to determine a lot of our metabolome. This is a fact, but it's not the only thing that impacts it. And this is what makes metabolomics a really interesting omic. So the exposome, our exposures, our environment, whether it's the food we eat, the chemicals we're deliberately or, or not deliberately exposed to, and things like how we sleep, how stressed we are, these are all things that will have an impact on our metabolome. And they will also impact our microbiome, which is another stream of influence. And the microbiome will contribute metabolites that will incorporate into the metabolome of the host. So let's say the human that is exposed uh, or that, that lives together with those different microbial entities. But this is the way we usually represent this cascade or this, this combination of omics. And as I prepared for this talk, I realized I actually need to adapt this a little bit. And so for today, I've made this version where it's not only that the microbiome is this external thing that is in or on us and influences our metabolome or our, our biology, uh, we also influence the microbiome. So our genes, the proteins that we make, the metabolites that we produce are going to have an influence, possibly selecting for certain species to grow other, rather than others. And there are interactions in both directions. So I slightly modified this slide for today, and I will consider whether we should modify this in the future as well. But this is to show that like all biological interactions and all species interaction, these are highly complex. And this is why each discipline goes in much depth to, to study their own topic and why when we come together, we're much stronger because we, we increase the complexity by putting our, our expertise together. Today, um, microbiome research is very much done um, by looking at the, the metagenomics, at looking for the genes of the species, especially bacterial species, but not only, that forever, for example, live in our gut or live on our skin or live in different places where we have microbial entities living with us. And, um, and this is often done in feces because it's a rather easy type of matrix to collect where there's a lot of microbial activity going on. Um, we will see today examples of samples that are collected within the GI tract. So before the feces actually come out, where you see very different things happening. But there are also different types of swabs where you can collect the microbiome in the locations where it lives. And so when we're interested in metabolomics, um, we can also, of course, measure the metabolites in those same samples. But we can also measure the metabolites in the blood where you don't want to have many, especially bacteria growing because this is basically your way to sepsis, but you still see um, a lot of microbial metabolites living there and they also contribute metabolites that they have in common with the host. That would, I will give a bit more insight into why blood is interesting, 
for metabolomics. But of course, you can also measure metabolomics in uh, in feces, in saliva, and in different swab um, samples that are also relevant. And so my argument here is that combining metabolomics with uh, metagenomics, with the, the typical microbiome measurements, is a way to access not only the description of the population, where even from the, the, the gene function, you might um, already be able to predict metabolism of these different microbial population, but to actually look at the metabolic impact, the metabolic contribution of the microbiome in the host by combining metabolomics with, with microbiome studies. And I mentioned that blood is a good matrix for metabolomics in the context of microbiome research because of the following reasons. If you look um, on the left, you have the typical example of the type of metabolites you would find in feces. Feces, in this context, is the metabolites that have been excreted. It's the ones that either were not absorbed by the host or that were also kicked out by the host. But they might not be the most relevant ones if you're interested in the impact that the microbiome is going to have on the host through these metabolites. Because if they do have an impact, so one part of the metabolites will be immediately consumed in the cells around. And so this is in the case of the gut microbiome, but they would be immediately consumed by the cells in the lining of the gut. But a lot of these metabolites are actually absorbed and then distributed to all different organs. And this is why if you perform metabolomics, for example, in brain tissue, you can find metabolites that are produced by exclusively by bacteria. So you know that they don't come from that tissue or the cells where they're identified, but they've actually been transported there. And the blood is therefore, as it is when you do human studies and you're interested in the human metabolism, where all the organs kind of chip in to produce this blood metabol metabolome, um, the blood is also a great place to see which metabolites from the different microbiomes in and on us are making their way inside the body and are being distributed everywhere. So it's a way of measuring the signals and the effects rather than what has been excreted. And then you can, of course, also, if you have access to tissues, depending on the type of studies that you do, you can also go in a case-by-case -case basis to measure which metabolites are there and what that could mean in the context that you're studying. And so metabolomics is applicable in all of those different matrices and more like urine and so on, and then can be related to changes that have been identified in the microbiome that you're interested in at the metagenomic level. The idea here is really to quantify impact. So how, how do we get to this? Um, and why is that important? Where does that matter? Last year, we've put together a white paper that we've uh, published on our website where we make a case for the role and the contribution of both diet and the microbiome together on the onset of chronic disease. So not only typical metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, but also diseases that clearly associate with uh, certain diets that clearly associate with microbiome dysbiosis, but where the metabolic link is not really clear. And so we've looked in studies, especially in metabolo metabolomic studies, to find out which are the metabolites that are the, the connection between these initial events and then the changes at the cell level, at the tissue level that progressively over decades cause chronic disease. And so what we do in that, in that white paper is that we anchor the significance of these studies at a mechanistic level. This supports us to make better study design in the future. We also have examples of uh, new druggable targets that, that can be identified in this way. And this also gives us idea to leverage things like diet and supplementation to support certain patients. And this one, I will not go into too much detail, but I just wanted to show you one example of the, the metabolic pathway schemes that we put together in this white paper. There are seven of them for six different diseases. And this one is looking into priming for autoimmune disease, where you have the different the changes in metabolite levels that come from either diet or microbiome changes or both, and that can be linked to different events here, for example, in, in priming our immune system and our body for autoimmune disease. So if you want to know more, I'll let you look into this white paper. You can find it easily on our website. And um, and I will go to the next part where we look into how the combination of metabolomics and microbiome can help us drive innovation. 
And to do this, I thought it would be interesting to look at a concept called 4P medicine, where you have these 4P that are personalized, predictive, preventive, and participatory medicine, which are basically a new way or an improved way of doing medicine, especially in understanding better how certain diseases happen. And this is very important um, for complex diseases in particular and finding ways to rather prevent them than to have to fix the, the damage once it's done. And the personalized aspect is really important here. There are a few examples, for example, this paper here, um, the Tinternaut paper where metabolomics has been used in certain screenings, and then you can extract which metabolites help, for example, to determine who is going to be responsive to a treatment, and then you can think of improved strategies to provide this treatment or to choose to give a treatment to certain types of patients and others, so all these stratification uh, strategies. FMT is also a, a technique that is, of course, very relevant in the field of, of microbiome research. That's fecal microbiota transplants. And this is the, as the name suggests, the transfer of fecal microbiota from a healthy donor to a person who could benefit from changing their gut microbiome in that way. And there are also studies that have looked for markers that help predict the responsiveness of patients to this technique, and uh, metabolomics has helped with this. Another very strong um, aspect of the application of microbiome in health is, um, is the use of prebiotics and postbiotics. I don't mention probiotics here because it's not literally related to the metabolites, but it's also relevant. But prebiotics are so the food of our microbiome. And postbiotics are the metabolites made, made by our microbiome. So, uh, metabolomics has also helped to look at um, how, for example, animal models respond to different types of diets. So what kind of prebiotics can help not just um, the overall health, but also help certain phenotypes. For example, here, the example that's on the left has to do with um, lung-related disease. And for the postbiotics examples, there's a very interesting study that's also discussed in the white paper where patients with multiple sclerosis were supplemented with propionic acid, so a short chain fatty acid, and this could help reduce inflammation and their, the flares that they had for the disease um, over a long period of time afterwards. And so here, I just wanted to show you one example of stratification, how metabolomics was used, just to have a concrete example here. In the volcano plot here, um, you see basically which metabolites in the serum of patients who were who uh, received treatment for uh, pancreatic cancer, which metabolites were discriminated between discriminating between the responders and the non-responders to the treatment. And 3-IAA, which is a microbial metabolite derived from indole itself, derived from tryptophan, um, was a clear discriminant uh, between the two groups. And this was the starting point for this group to, um, to go on with experiments in an animal model of pancreatic cancer that also received the chemotherapy, but before that they received an FMT from responders and non-responders. And overall, what was really striking is that either by providing the substrate to produce this specific metabolite or in non-responders by providing the metabolite directly by supplementation, you could increase or completely activate the efficacy of the chemotherapy in the animal model. So this still has to be confirmed, the actual clinical trial, but this is a really promising way of uh, stratifying patients for this specific application and similar um, applications can be done for other diseases and for other um, uses of biomarkers. So in summary, um, we can look at three reasons why metabolomics should be an integral part of a multiomic approach, especially in the context of microbiome research. The functional readout is often what is brought up. The metabolome is an actual effector of what's happening in the body. So it's a functional readout in the host, but it's also a functional readout of, to some extent, what the microbiome is doing and the effect it's having on the host. It can be a nice compl complementation of uh, gene-derived uh, functional analysis and can also replace it or expand it by looking directly at the metabolites. Um, when you have broad enough panels, you can uh, provide also comprehensive analysis. You can go deeper and to look really at what has changed and, and what is relevant. 
And also, I must mention that when you have quantitative metabolomics, you can do then a lot more things, for example, using sums of uh, metabolites, using specific ratios of metabolites um, that are going to bring you additional value in your analysis. Um, biomarkers are, of course, a huge field in the, in the metabolomics field. And so whether it's for diagnosis or prognosis or to monitor or improve response to therapy, they can be hugely uh, beneficial, as I've shown you in the previous slides. And you can look at the interactions between host and microbiome. You can find new targets. Um, I haven't mentioned this in too, de in too much detail, but in the white paper, we also detail a few examples of potential new targets um, for, for drug development. And it's a hugely valuable tool for personalized therapies as is microbiome. So to put those two together is a great way to, to find specific therapies for, for each individual. And all of that by keeping the systems level understanding that allows us to be both to like holistic and at the same time specific. 